Hey, welcome back. I'm Dr. Bob Cargill, and I am once again pleased to welcome Dan McClellan, Dr. Dan McClellan, back to discuss many, many things. We're always happy to have Dan McClellan. Dan, welcome back. Well, thank you so much, Bob. I appreciate it. Always happy to join you and uh, to talk about uh, these issues that are going on in the the world of uh, the Bible and archaeology. Yeah. You know, my students are the ones that are actually saying when I'm in class, they're saying they saw the video with you and they said, we talk to him more. They they want to see it, you know, become like a regular thing. They, they want to see. I, I like your students. They sound very insightful. Yeah. <laughs> they're smart people and they, they know who to uh, to look for. Uh, I think that's because they're watching you. Uh, I also think it's because you're in more places than I am. You're out on TikTok. You're out on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, your, uh, where else are you? You're on, oh, on, on YouTube, of course. On YouTube. I'm on Instagram as well. Uh, did my first Instagram live yesterday. I, I'm always nervous when I do a live uh, on a new platform, but it went great. I had a lot of fun. Um, and then I've, uh, I've also got a new website that I just started up after my, my recent online class on Satan and the Bible, uh, that is at mcclellan.org. And that's uh, M-A-K-L-E-L-A-N, the phonetic spelling of my last name that I used uh, while I was living in South America. Uh, makes for a handy, um, a handy username because nobody uses it anywhere. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's a good one. You don't have to go out and pay a bunch of money to try to get it from somebody who some domain <laughs> service that bought it. Yeah, I remember that. I bought my name back in gosh, 1999 or 2000. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so it was back when I was working in the industry. But uh, yeah, so congratulations on all of these new endeavors. You have a new website. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll have the domain down here. You also have right. a new podcast. Tell, tell us about the new podcast you've got coming. Yeah. So actually later today, I'm going to record uh, with my partner the third episode. And we wanted to get three episodes down and then we're going to launch. And uh, it's called Data Over Dogma. And uh, it's basically going to be doing the same kinds of things I do uh, elsewhere on social media, try to increase access to the scholarly study of the Bible and religion, and then try to combat the spread of misinformation about the Bible and religion. Uh, we spoke for one of the episodes we've already recorded. We spoke with my good friend and former dissertation supervisor, Francesca Stavrikopoulou, about her new book and some of her work. Uh, we, uh, our first episode is going to be called In the Beginning, and um, we're kind of taking a step-by-step -step walk through uh, Genesis 1 through 3. Uh, just to talk about what's in there, what it's doing there. And uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about some of the archaeological controversies that have been in the news recently uh, on today's episode. And so, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, a podcast is a new medium for me, but uh, I really enjoy the longer form stuff. And uh, it's a little, you know, I've got to be on my toes being on camera and uh, uh, for a longer period of time, uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. So yeah, within the next week or two, our first episode should be out. So that will be uh, something that I'll be promoting. That's good. That's good. Congrats on the on the new podcast. I can Thank tell you. you it 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 starts piling up the the work, but I know that you're up to it. Um, uh, hire a staff. Hire a staff. That's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. We're we're in the yeah. process now of, of putting together more folks to to help out with the media. Because yeah. it's uh, it's daunting. Um, I've got to get people. That's yeah, what, no, that's uh, people. Every time I talk with somebody who's been doing this for a while, they're like, "Have your people talk to my people." I'm like, <laughs> "I don't have people, dude. <laughs> I have me, and and uh, that's about it." So yeah, well, no, it's it's that's important to have good people around, and yeah, and this you know this is a conversation that you and I have had for a long time, but you know, and I and my colleagues, it's it's also important to be kind. It's also important to be nice. Uh, especially within our field, which which um, hasn't always been the kindest field. I mean, most yeah. most academic fields, but but have this reputation. But it's always good to promote good scholarship and to promote our colleagues and to try to, to the best of our ability, try to promote you know people in a, in a kind and in an uplifting way. Um, I, I just think that's the best way to go about being a scholar. Yeah. And if you get something wrong, admit you got it wrong and. And we'll talk about this in just a second because you and I yeah. both put out videos mm -hmm. this past week about something it's because tis the season, but we'll, we'll come yeah, back yeah. to this, uh, to this inscription. Um, you also have uh, an upcoming course, by the way, congrats mm -hmm. on the success of the last course that you had 
Uh, but you have an upcoming, another one coming up, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on uh, April 6th, though, uh, that's a Thursday, uh, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. I'm going to be doing another online course, and this one will be on how we got the biblical canon. So we'll talk about the canonization of the Hebrew Bible, the canonization of the New Testament. I'll start off with some popular myths about where we got the canon from that uh, have spread because of uh, folks like Dan Brown and others. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, we will uh, spend about an hour talking about uh, where these things came from, how they developed, who was responsible, and uh, yeah, hopefully give everybody a more informed um, insight onto this process, and, and maybe that will help them better understand the Bible that they have, what is not in there, why it's not in there, um, and think a little more critically about how they approach the collection of texts that they know as the Bible. So, um, and that's something that's available for registration on my on my website, mcclellan.org. And just like all my classes, it's a donation thing. Pay whatever you like. Uh, I've got a minimum donation of a dollar, and I always have plenty of folks who join us for a dollar, and we're happy to have them there. I want to try to make this as accessible as I can, while also making sure that I can do this full time and keep food on the table. So. Right. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it a great deal. And all my previous classes, recordings are also available on that website as well. Wonderful. And what's the, what's the time and date for that class again? So that will be Thursday, April 6th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Mountain Time. So you're in the central time zone, so that'll be 8 to 9.30 uh, p.m. I do a one-hour presentation and then 30 minutes of a, of a live Q&A. And I'm glad that it's going to be a, an online course because it is presently snowing quite heavily right now <laughs> in Iowa City here in the central time zone. So yep, yep. We'll, be able to, <laughs> we'll be able to tune in. And you're saying it's going to be a lengthy course. So you're saying that the Bible wasn't canonized at the Council of Nicaea upon dictate <laughs> of Constantine. Yeah, that's that's the theory, isn't it? But um, no, that's there's absolutely no truth to that. We can we can see that theory. The first time anyone talks about anything related to that idea is actually from around the year 900, um, where we have this text called the Synodicon Vetus, which is basically a collection of uh, accounts of the synods that the Christian Church had had over the previous several centuries. And there's a story in there where the uh, at Nicaea, they stacked all the scriptures up on a table and then miraculously all the apocryphal texts fell to the ground and left only what is now in our canon on the table. And, and that get, gets picked up centuries later. Voltaire mentions it, uh, 19th century writers mentioned it, and then Dan Brown decided to stick it in uh, uh, in his book, The Da Vinci Code, and now it is all over the place, and I'm doing my best to to scrub it clean from <laughs> from the public conscience because there's just no truth to it. It is a convenient, nice story to tell, uh, as is you know the Arthur legends of the Grail and you know and all of these things. But yeah, the one of the things that I always you know, try to tell to my students is that the Bible's a whole lot more messier than this. It really yeah. is like making laws and sausage, right? It's, <laughs> you really don't want to see how this was made. Yeah. And do you think it's because a lot of people feel that it takes away from the concept of inspiration of the, of the text? I think there's a degree of that. Um, I think these stories are popular though because they're they're very simple to grasp and they kind of resonate with concerns that people have today regarding a lot of social issues. It makes a lot of people feel good if if this whole process can be reduced to powerful white men sitting around a table, um, you know, just arbitrating uh, regarding this stuff. And you know that uh, that speaks to a lot of people today, and it allows them to feel comfortable in whatever particular ideas they have about the text as either a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and it's easily communicated, and it's easily remembered. And so those are the things that are just going to spread more and and more rapidly. Right. Uh, but I think it probably, you know, there are probably different reasons different folks uh, latch on to that story. But uh, yeah. mainly, it's Dan Brown's fault. <laughs> <laughs> blame Dan Brown. Yeah, oh, you know, I blame him for everything. Yeah, no, this is and this is the always the the thing that I always wrestle with is I like his books. I you know, I I I actually like him as an entertaining, you know, you yeah. you're at the beach and you you know, I used to live at the beach there in Malibu and 
to to flip through this stuff and entertaining read, you know, somebody who's actually trying to engage the the yeah. biblical world and the ancient world. But it passes on this misinformation, which then means I got to go on television and try to debunk the stuff that Dan <laughs> Brown is doing. So it keeps me in, yeah. it keeps me in work, right? But um, yeah, it, it, you know, I guess the the question is. Why is it so important to go out and combat these false myths? To to go out and try try to say, actually, that's not how it happened. In a public mm -hmm. setting, we do it all the time in the classroom, right? Where we right. put together lectures and we show the research, and but very few people get to see that. Why is it important to do it in a public setting? Well, I think the a lot of the folks who are spreading these. You know, whether they're conspiracy theories, whether they're just misunderstandings, misapprehensions about the history, a lot of them have very large platforms and they use these tidbits to uh, appeal to the prejudices and the identity politics of uh, the general public. And they're not confined to speaking to 10, 20, maybe 50 people at a time in a closed classroom. They're speaking. Uh, on you know the Rogan Experience podcast, or they're speaking uh, on television, or or something like that, and they've got an enormous audience, and these things spread rapidly. There's the old saying: a, a lie can travel uh, halfway around the world before the truth gets out of bed or gets its shoes on, or or whatever. And so there needs to be something somewhat comparable to combat the spread of that inf misinformation because it spreads so rapidly. And unfortunately, a lot of folks who are in the academy have the training and the resources and the skills to be able to directly confront that misinformation are either don't have the opportunity to do so, or they just can't develop a platform that's large enough. And so I've been pleasantly surprised that there is quite a large audience out there for this kind of information. I was really worried initially about the appeal of, of what I'm doing because I'm, it's a lot more popular to say, I'm on this team and this team's right and the other team's wrong. Right. But half the time I'm saying neither team is right. Or I'm saying, you know, the other team is kind of right. And our, you know the team that I um, count myself among is right. is kind of wrong, and so that's not going to appeal to uh, what a lot of people want to get out of this if they're seeking entertainment uh, or they're seeking to have their prejudices or their biases um, kind of uh, have that itch scratched. And um, I've been pleasantly surprised. There are a lot of people who are very interested in knowing the data and just being able to do what needs to be done with the data and not being told. This supports this side, this supports the other side. Uh, but yeah, I think it's phenomenally important. I, I hope to see more folks out there um, doing this. I know that has been one of the main focuses of, of your career, initially doing this with, uh, with film and television stuff, um, consulting with uh, folks who are producing. I know that's been a big part of what you do. And I'm just happy to see that there's an audience out there and that there are other scholars who are starting to pick up that torch to the degree that they're able and uh, and run with it. And I would love to see the universities who uh, are employing a lot of these scholars make that part of their job title to right. so do public scholarship, to engage what's going on in the public. Because not only does it just move too fast for us to wait for books or articles to come out, uh, but if you know we're having too many committee assignments and, and all that <laughs> other administrative stuff that just clogs up the gears, uh, you know we got to prioritize and and maybe we don't have an opportunity to go respond to this thing that is a story that breaks today and then tomorrow everybody says oh never mind uh, or something like that. Well, I mean when you and I first started started addressing this and again we weren't the first ones there were there were we are standing on the shoulders of the mark goodacres of the world and the and the james davila's uh the people who came before us who mm -hmm. who were out there blogging let's say the the, the people yeah. who were out there scholars right in the academy with credentials and there are many others i'm, I'm leaving names out but these were people who were kind of leading the charge in blogging when people were saying, oh, blogging, I remember one person in particular who I won't name. Bloggers are just, you know, 400 pound people in their underwear on their bed, you know, just, you know, just, <laughs> you remember this, you will call this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they're just, you know, just making comments on their, on their computer. 
And mm. we thought it was important to actually address things because we don't want to wait for a year for some prestigious journal to, to publish it. They need to be addressed immediately. And I remember uh, Eric and Carol Myers saying, we need to address some of this stuff uh, immediately. We, you know, the, the misinformation in the media. And they put together that conference at Duke University, that very important conference. And they brought together archaeologists and scholars and they, and they said, how can we change this? And I remember a lot of the scholars who were kind of looking down their noses at blogging, many of them have blogs now, right? They, they yeah. finally, the technology <laughs> caught up and now they are having blogs. And I see the same phenomenon happening, not only with television and documentaries and appearances like this, there were a lot of people who were doing this early on, and now they are more comfortable with the media, but with YouTube, with TikTok with Twitter. Now, as a as, at the University of Iowa, our governor signed a law that prevents me from going on TikTok. I can't legally, as a as an employee at the University of Iowa, use TikTok. Uh, but oh, I can wow. go on YouTube. I can go on Twitter and these other things. And we're starting to address this thing. And it goes back to one of the things that I thought was important early on in my career was I always wanted to go where the students are. Mm -hmm. It's it's important as a professor. To, to go to where the students are, at least to meet them halfway. And if they were on Facebook, I wanted to go to Facebook and try to use Facebook as a tool to teach, to, you know, to meet them where they were. And now I realized, uh, just turning 50, the students aren't on Facebook as much anymore. This is, this is, <laughs> it used to be email to Facebook and now it's Facebook to Instagram. And, you know, and, and they're on, they're on Twitter and right? leaving Twitter now, they're right. They're on TikTok and they're on Instagram and they're on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so now the, the thing is, where do we go where we can have the maximum impact to address these, uh, th this misinformation? And this is why I think this is the next thing. And now, if you look carefully, you're seeing the credentialed scholars, you're seeing the guys with their, with their union cards starting mm -hmm. to do this as well. And the case that I'm making, and I'm so thankful for the University of Iowa, is that they're they're agreeing with this and they're saying, let's just leverage this content that we're using in the classroom and let's use the media to put this out in the public. We're a public university. Let's mm -hmm. go out into the media and uh, put this information out there, combat this misinformation. And in the meantime, we're marketing to new students. We're recruiting new students. We're getting the brand out there. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious to see how long it takes for other universities to start doing this same thing. Cause I think it's important and I don't just yeah. think it's combating misinformation. I think it's a tool that universities can use. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with you. I think there are, um, it's usually the smaller universities that kind of get out a, a, at the vanguard of some of these technological um, transitions. And yeah, I, I hope more universities get on board with that because that will make the work a lot easier. Uh, I think it will enable scholars to be able to cover a lot more because I spend some time well outside of my wheelhouse and my specialization. I think I had a video yesterday where I had to talk about entomology and share some, some papers about uh, bugs. Um, and I was well out of my wheelhouse, but luckily I, I could identify what the, um, the scholarship was saying. But yeah, it's it's a lot more than um, a small handful of scholars can handle, but we're starting to see people in different specializations do it, and and hopefully the universities will pick up on that and facilitate more and more scholars doing that. I think I saw that video. It was about the gall, right? The guy was trying to make some tie into the to the gall fed to Jesus yeah. on the cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That there's a, a little bug that they make the scholar yeah, die was, from. Let's say it was a stretch. No, I, <laughs> I look. I've I've been a big champion for Canada's work. I mean, she, she, again, at the forefront of trying to do this on a, uh, on a public level, both on television, but also in the, in the popular press, that daily beast, uh, column that, that she writes is, is a, a must read. I mean, she just does yeah. some excellent work there. Francesca over in Europe doing with working with the BBC and, and trying to do the same thing over there. Uh, yeah. your advisor, just just doing some you know some some good work but i think this is where the students are and this is where we all need to be headed especially those of us who work at public universities 
we need to acknowledge that the academy is changing and that the things that have worked in the past years, basically asking some institution for money and then holding a conference in which we invite other scholars and then publishing uh, a volume that are read by scholars, isn't necessarily going to make the difference, make the changes, especially mm -hmm. politically, that, that are needed. You were mentioning the basically the the dichotomy the the isolation on on the two extremes right there are there are people who want to pick teams and mm -hmm. we're basically losing the middle and as someone who tries very hard to stand in the middle and to say we need to talk to each other and we need to be able to say this extreme is wrong and this extreme is wrong and if we look at the research, the answer is probably somewhere here in the center. If we can't do that academically, then how do we expect people to, to do this politically? And then we go like this and we wonder why the, why the country is so divided. We need to demonstrate, at least model, that this is possible academically. Yeah. And, and right now, the, the academy is really kind of a closed system. I mean, we preach to each other to publish to each other so that we can satisfy requirements so that we can advance our own uh, standing within the, the academy. And until it's more outward facing, I, it doesn't seem to me like the priority is going to be on spreading knowledge on confronting this uh, misinformation and all that stuff. It's going to be on people looking out for their own. And, you know, they can't be blamed for that, for trying to um, to scratch out their own living. But the yeah, in, in many ways, the academy is just set up as as a, a way to advance one's own interests uh, on the backs of, of advancing the interests of the people uh, above them. And um, yeah, I think it's self-defeating. The academy is changing. We're not People are looking at education in very different ways now. We've, uh, what is it, Liberty University now is going to be fully remote. They're not even going to have uh, the in-person classes anymore. At some point in the near future, it's uh, just changing all to uh, online classes. And uh, the nature of education is, uh, is going to leave the academy behind if we don't adapt and, uh, and figure out a way to remain relevant outside of our own little closed right. system. And yeah, ad addressing the the dichotomies and the uh, the social inequalities and the problems that are being fought over right now. Right. Yeah, I think there's a lot that the data that we can produce can do to help those discussions. But as long as it's always about fighting for one team against the other, right. uh, it's going to be it's just going to perpetuate those fights. And, and look and for everyone else out there listening, we're not trying to say that you shouldn't do original research. You have to do original research. We have to do new research and research universities need to focus on research. What, what we're talking about is translating that research to the public. If, if we, we talk about research for the sake of research and the new discoveries that come out of that. Penicillin's always pointed at, right? You know, we're, we're just mm -hmm. doing this research and then look what we discovered and look how many lives this saves. But in the humanities, when we're doing this very, you know, these deep dives and picking apart verbs, you know, Semitic verbs, and and we we continue to publish deeper and deeper into these niches. And then we, you know, we publish and we uh, award ourselves and we get promoted. If that never translate, not only to our students, to our undergraduate students, but if it never translates outside of the academy, it's fair to ask, what difference are we making? And in the meantime, while other charlatans and, and political people, uh, apologists, are using their microphone to basically shape the public to where they mm -hmm. want to go politically, is it any surprise that we're seeing what we're seeing? Yeah. And this is the argument that I think, you know, you and I are making is that that original research has to translate out into the public and somebody needs to stand up and say, this is why this is relevant. This is why this is important. We have mm -hmm. to take a stand publicly and explain in a kind way to the public why 
biblical studies, archaeology, is important to uh, a relevant, you know, may, why is it relevant to a modern society? Because uh, mm -hmm. it matters. It matters. It yeah. has to go out. And we can't just cower in the ivory tower because we're afraid of what somebody's going to say about us in the YouTube comments. You, you have yeah. to get out there and explain to the public why this matters. Otherwise, we're going to yield all of that ground to politicians who are just going to say, we'll tell you better what the Bible says and okay. scholars become completely irrelevant. Yeah. And I, and I think there's a model for that already. Uh, I mean, science has, in a sense, kind of um, already tread some of that ground. We had folks like Carl Sagan, Stephen Gould. We've got Neil deGrasse Tyson, mm -hmm. Hank Green. There are others who for decades have been trying to democratize access to this research that for a long time went on in that ivory tower among those elites who uh, you know, didn't make it digestible to a general public. And that changed the way that people think and talk about science. You know, you have TV shows now, The Big Bang Theory, that kind of popularizes this this figure, the kind of nerdy scientist who tries who you know tries to be a popularizer of uh, of scientific knowledge, and and I, I think that would be a great model to follow. And um, yeah, and and hopefully the. But yeah, the structure of uh, of the academy needs to change a little bit in order for that to happen. I'm I'm working on it, man. I'm working on it. I'm pushing. <laughs> I'm pitching. I appreciate. That. I'm pitching. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, but no, you're right. Uh, you know, there were these. There were these men. I love. I love Sagan so much. I just love listening to his voice and, and and hearing what he did. And and he, you know, looking back and the barbs that he was taking at the time were so risky. But. Mm -hmm. And and how's science doing now? We have a. a large portion of this country that just ignores science. Mm -hmm. And what do we expect that that same group is going to do to the Bible? What, what do we think mm -hmm. that they're going to think about archaeology if we don't get out there and try to make archaeology and the Bible, the, the critical study of the Bible, not apologetics, not theology, mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. critical study of the Bible relevant to them. It needs to be addressed. And this is why yeah. I think what you're doing is so very important. Oh, thank you. And and I think what you're doing is important as well. And um, yeah, I, it makes me think of Indiana Jones, which was a bit of a misstep uh, in an attempt to kind of popularize that. People have a very wrong opinion about, uh, about what archaeology is now because of that. And what's funny is I noticed that a lot of the folks who are spreading this information, particularly about archaeology, all seem to be dressed like Indiana Jones. They all, they are. Yeah. I, I cannot tell you how many times I've been asked on, on these shows that I, that I get asked to go on, would you wear the hat or, you know, would you, would you wear this <laughs> shirt? And I was like, man, I dig in tie dye. I dig yeah. <laughs> in tie dye shirts. So, <clears throat> you know, I'll, you, you need to wear a hat, right? You got to wear a big, a yeah, big hat yeah. to keep the sun off, but I dig in tie dye. And yeah. so, um, but yeah, they, there's this image that you're supposed to look like. And if you look yeah. at some of these shows that have made it on the television and have been somewhat moderately successful, look at how they're dressed. Um, you know, they're dressing up as some indie clone, you know, and yeah, it's, a, it's a character there. It's a character. Playing. Yeah, they're dressing up as a character. And so, I, you know, I've been advocating what we need is a show where you get a real biblical scholar and a real archaeologist to go out and have discussions with other archaeologists, have discussions with people who don't. And this is the other thing. You can't just talk to the people who agree with you. You have to go out and talk to the people that you don't agree with. This is the only way it's going to work. You have to go out yeah. and talk to the people who don't agree with you and say, tell me what you're Anthony Bourdain used to do this, right? He used to talk to people who disagreed with him and then mm -hmm. he'd say, all right, well, I, I don't. And he, he would say, I don't like this kind of food. I hate this stuff. But he mm -hmm. would at least give them a voice and you could hear you could hear the different sides. And I thought Anthony did a great job, too, of at least if if he's not agreeing on on the main things, he would find common ground. Yeah. He would find ways to relate to them so that 
even if you didn't agree with this person, it humanized the person and it allowed you to feel like, you know, we still share a connection. There's still something to appreciate here. Um, even if he's in a, he always found things in, in different cultures to appreciate and to hold up as something that we should all take note of, even if, um, you know, disagreed with, um, with certain aspects of it, which I think is a, is rare, but I think he did a great job of that. He he demonstrated a fundamental respect for human dignity. Even if he yeah. fundamentally disagreed with them politically or with what they were doing, he at least demonstrated this is part of America or this, you know, wherever he was. This is this mm -hmm. is part of who we are. And you don't have to agree with it, but this is who we are. And mm -hmm. he's he was going to show the world this is what's there. And then you get to decide whether this is how you want to be, what you want to be like, if you want to go visit this, if you want to eat this food or, you know, talk to this person. But mm -hmm. he, we have to talk to each other. We have to talk to each other. And I got up in my classroom this past week and I said just that. We did a little AMA in my classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, this is when they told me that they wanted me to talk to you more. They wanted to have, you know, have more <laughs> of you, right? Uh, but I said, we have to talk to each other. Uh, and you don't have to agree with everything that I say as a professor. And I'm not trying to, you know, I, I make a promise to every class that I teach. You don't have to believe a thing that I say, and I'll never try to make you believe anything. And I'll never try to mm -hmm. convince you to believe anything. I do need you to listen to the things that I'm trying to, to teach. I'm trying to expose you to different ways of thinking. And then you can mm -hmm. do what you want with that. And mm -hmm. they're, I think they're getting that. And, I, and the, the only way to do that is I have to be very real. I have, I have mm -hmm. to be very open uh, in, a, in a way that I think makes a lot of people uncomfortable. I mean, other professors, like they, they wouldn't be comfortable necessarily doing that. But I think students appreciate authenticity. I think the public appreciates authenticity. And that leaves you wide open for criticism. It leaves you wide open for, for all kinds of things. Uh, and you can just not read the comments, which is advice. Yeah. I mean, don't feed the trolls, but <laughs> I think people appreciate authenticity, especially this generation yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that is, absolutely. that is necessarily cynical because of the misinformation that they've been fed. I think they can appreciate authenticity. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of the, the younger generation, there's a, there's a tendency towards not being very forgiving either. Um, uh, and. And I, I think that's something that that's concerned me as well. And that's and that's something that I try to model on my social media uh, is not attacking the person. Yes. Talking about the ideas that they're talking about. I can be pretty rhetorical sometimes. And there are some people who, you know, are, <laughs> can get under my skin. I'm human. But at the same time, I've had people who come back and said, you were right. I was wrong. I appreciate the correction. I'm going to take down my video. I'm going to put your video on my channel. I'm going to really? highlight it. Yeah, I get asked that question all the time. Does anybody ever respond to your stuff? And usually no. And the majority of people who do respond are responding by defending themselves or criticizing me. And, yeah. you know, there's there's plenty to criticize about me, <laughs> but usually they, they latch on to rather superficial things. Yeah. But every now and then somebody will correct themselves and will seek to grow from it. And that is always, and, and every time that happens, I try to hold it up and show that, you know, I'm, it's not that I hate this person or I want them to go away. This was a, for me, it was a teaching opportunity and they took the opportunity to learn something and better themselves because of it. And I applaud them for it. Uh, and so there, you know, there are people who only get one strike in society these days right. and that's, and that's problematic. Nobody's yeah. perfect. Everybody's right. going to strike out from time to time. And so, um, I, I try to model that on my, on my channel, but that's another thing that I think, uh, we would do well to, uh, to take note of where, you know, there's, it's very, it's not that I'm against cancel culture because I don't see cancel culture as that most of the time i think that's a uh, i think that's a caricature of something entirely yeah. different that's going on but but yeah when people acknowledge mistakes right. and correct them i i think that's um that shows their humanity and shows that people right. can uh improve and when they acknowledge that they've grown we've all made mistakes and but when they acknowledge that they've grown when they've changed when they've I used to be this way. I learned from this, and and yeah. now I've grown from that. I I like to I like to do that. I do appreciate on your videos that the very first thing I see uh, is you posting 
do not go to this person's site and troll them. Do not criticize them. Don't don't troll yeah. their comments. I appreciate that. I, I noticed that, that you have that in, in the comments there. Um, yeah, I think that that's was, a good thing. That was something that I've decided to do because of a number of bad experiences. And, yeah. and I've talked about this uh, in the past on my channel. The last thing I want to do is run somebody off of of social media, right. which has happened a couple of times. People have deleted their accounts uh, or I don't want a bunch of people who are either uh, followers of my account or who just come across my video to go over there and harass right. or even threaten right. no. other people. That happens as well. And it just, it, it bothers me to no end that that happens. Right. And, and so I, I don't like the fact that I have to curate my content that way, but that's that's the way I've found to, to make it clear that's, um, you know, if you're doing that kind of stuff, you're not a supporter of, of my channel or, right. or of my rhetorical goals, as I'm uh, fond right. of referring to. Uh, I think that's good. I think that's noble and admirable. One thing I have noticed, uh, another change since you've been doing this full time. Uh, what, what's what's uh, what's this happening <laughs> down there? You know, when I start, when I came to Iowa 10 years ago, this was brown. Uh, yeah. And wow. uh, four kids later, uh, <laughs> I, I, I have adult onset Santa Claus. Uh, is that is that what's uh, what's what's going on here? Something's going on here. <laughs> yeah, I um, <laughs> I when I, uh, I I hate shaving. It's the worst thing in the world for yes. me. My skin is very sensitive. I don't like it at all. And for the last decade, I have had to shave, if not every day, at least a couple of times a week. And I just hate it more than anything in the world. So that's the first thing I did when uh, when I left my my previous employer was decide <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and I've uh, I've been told I've I've been told by by more than one person uh, in my extended family and then in the general public you don't look great clean shaven um you look better with a beard so i like it I'm, i mean I've... i'm just give uh fine i give up um i'm gonna do the the beard thing i like it i especially like uh the the white i think that uh, uh adds a little bit of distinction yeah. uh, to things. no it's and, it's, a, it's a distinctive look so it's i, I would yeah. say keep it going don't cut it <laughs> off you're not going to hear a complaint out of me <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, no I just I just picked up a, a beard care kit. There you uh, go off the internet, so that uh, I have I have a couple of friends in the academy who actually um, participate in beard competitions, um, and so there's uh, that. I'm not interested in doing any of that, nope. but I have I I've got a little peek inside the world of beard care, and so uh, I'm I'm now dabbling in um, in taking care of. Uh, of my facial furniture, as I once heard someone refer to it. <laughs> God, <laughs> you know, uh, the the guy. We have lots of colleagues, as you know, that have that have beards. But uh, Christian Brady, Christian oh, Brady yeah. is the one who's got like the most. I mean, that's a that's Very a good beard, right? Yeah. Here are two yeah. men, by the way, uh, talking about um, the distinction of other men's beards. <laughs> so just so this is this is going to be the intro, right? I'm going to cut this and put it at the front, just. <laughs> Two men talking about other men's beards. Anyways, a yeah. um, couple of other things. Uh, Tis the season. There mm -hmm. was an inscription that came out um, last week. This was March 1st. Uh, we saw an inscription that said, nice and, nice and centered there, Darius, yeah. right? This is King Darius, the Persian king. And I think you and I both went online and said, something's not right here. Yeah, quite convenient that this is when it's coming out. And and I had somebody uh, who lives in Israel comment and say, oh, we've known about this for a few months. Right. Um, it was October, November, something like that, that it was initially discovered. And so it's been something that folks in that field have been talking about for a bit, but they, re they intentionally released it. Uh, just the week before putting right. uh, in order to um, to get some some extra attention. Right. And then we we made these videos and we said, yeah, this is, is anybody else. I mean, I mine was just very blunt about it. Is anybody else suspicious about this? And two days later, the IAA, speaking of organizations that do the right thing, that admit, hey, we got this wrong. Are bad. We want to. We want to correct this. Is and so I said, good on the IAA. Good job. 
they admit their mistake and they said, this is, you know, we got this wrong and they put out the correction. And so this was clearly uh, not an authentic uh, inscription mm -hmm. and they put it out there. And then we saw these same newspaper companies, right? The big ones turn around and criticize the IAA for being duped basically for, for mm -hmm. announcing this, this, um, inauthentic inscription. I have two comments and I want to get your, your opinion on this. Yeah. One, is that not a little bit hypocritical of these newspaper companies for one publishing an unprovenanced object? They knew it was unprovenanced. We've been jumping up and down about this for a long time. This isn't, they knew it was unprovenanced. Everyone said it was an un unprovenanced object and yet they're publishing it as well. By the way, this was an embargoed story. Did we not notice that it all came out? They all three published it at the same time on the same date. Mm -hmm. They had this story and they held it and they held it. And then they turn around and say, oh, shame on the IAA for getting duped on this. This is another reason why you do not publish unprovenanced objects, because then yeah. you you're you're contributing to the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was the the confidence with which they posted that that initial story was an issue and i i thought the quote this is authentic no modern hand could do this was such an irony when it turned out it was a modern hand who was not trying to fool anybody who was just trying to demonstrate to <laughs> to students or are you are you suspicious of that story this is point 2 <clears throat> okay now so one, the newspapers, you know, coming out and saying shame on the IAA for, for, you know, saying that this was authentic when they're part of the problem, right? They're continuing to pub and they'll say, well, we're doing, we're just reporting the news, but you're publishing a story about an unprovenanced object. You knew it was un. in fact, you held this story and you, this was an embargoed story and you all pushed it out on the same day, six days before Purim. You're, you, this is why we choose at Bible and Archaeology. And when I was at my previous publication, one of the first changes I made was we're not going to publish any more unprovenanced objects. We're not even going to report on them because we mm -hmm. don't want to contribute to this. Uh, now, that has since changed uh, since I left my previous publication. But, yeah, you know. but the, you sh we should not be publishing perpetuating this for this reason. My, my other issue is I don't think I buy, I'm still got red flags about this whole, uh, it was a teaching exercise gone awry. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and because it's, that's too convenient of a story for getting, for covering up basically the fact that everybody got duped. I, I, I'm suspicious of that story as well, because it was a teaching exercise gone awry that just so happened to lie on the surface until the media advisor for the president of Israel that many months later, I still, I, I am still suspicious about that story. I also noticed, and at least I haven't heard the name of the person who came to them and I know that they're, you know, apparently trying to protect her. Uh, yeah. And, you know, why would you be inscribing on a baked piece of pottery the, a name? You know, we, they weren't doing that anyway. They would write it in ink well, at the time. The, yeah. And normally you wouldn't make it seem as if it were just a fragment from a larger inscription because um, you've got the lines above. You've got one word on the right and you've got the beginning of a word on, on the left. It does seem... A little odd that they would be like, all right, I'm gonna make this look like this, so this seems 
more like uh, and you know what we would find from from the ancient world. I can I can see that because that story does kind of absolve everybody of of any nefarious intent and just make it seem like they drop the ball um, in the in the analysis. Um, but which also kind of puts egg on the face of the the individual who was named uh, as the um, the individual from the IAA responsible for the analyses that were run. But yeah, that is I, the story is too convenient. It, it it puts all of the blame on one person, and it makes it look like oh, it's 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 the it, it's the least nefarious of, and then everybody can say oh, it wasn't a fake. It was just not authentic. I seem to think that I don't want to say that that it's uh, I'm, I'm just my BS detector is still up on the cover story. You know, if it's a cover okay. story, I yeah. I think there might be more to that story as well, just because mm. it's too convenient of an explanation, even if it mm. is, even if it was a teaching exercise, it's a bad teaching exercise. And it was delayed until, and it just so happened to get through everyone. I don't know. Maybe, eh, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that out loud, right? But I, it's just too convenient of a story. It's a fake. Mm -hmm. Let's. I, I read a, yeah. an article by by a by a reporter that I that I highly respect. Said it's not a fake. It's just not authentic. It is a fake. It's a fake. It's a, it's a it's not it's not real. And yeah. a bunch of newspapers published it. It's it, we, it's it's a fake. It's unprovenanced, and they published it anyway. And then they want to turn around and shame the IAA for for getting duped. It's this is why you don't publish this stuff. Yeah, yeah, and it, and one of the things that it does is it incentivizes more people who might have the skills and the resources to be able to create these fakes to go out and do it. And that's something that uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments from 2002 spent almost 20 years uh, being treated as authentic fragments. A lot of money changed hands uh, for those fragments. And now it seems that, that they're all fakes as well. Um, you and I have talked about the uh, Jordan-led codices in the past. Uh, there are and, and I'm sure you've heard about this 1,500-year-old Bible out of Turkey with the gold lettering on it that is very clearly from the the last century at, at the most. Right. Uh, and, you know, that kind of stuff spreads all over the place. And, and there seem to be a lot of folks, there seems to be an industry for yeah. this kind of thing these days and an industry that is getting more and more refined yeah. and more and more competent. Uh, and and so yeah, the unprovenance uh, artifacts are are such an enormous problem. And I don't think a lot of the public knows why it's an issue. That uh, they don't know why people are suggesting publishers should not publish anything that is based on you know even if it's not in archaeology, even in over in biblical studies, publishers uh, should not publish an argument that is based on. Uh, unprovenance uh, artifacts because it just it just perpetuates the demand uh, and the uh, the industry that creates those things. And if this, whatever the origin of this inscription, the Darius inscription, imagine where we would be or where things would be years down the road if someone didn't come forth or if someone didn't um, let them know whatever the state, the actual state of affairs is. Uh, you know, that's going to get, that would be published and there would be dissertations that yep. would have something to yep. do with that. There would be money that would change hands based on that. Um, I'm sure there would be a lot more people um, hiking around um, La Quiche, yeah. uh, if that were the case. Well, and, it, it encourages looting. Yeah. And if, if you've been to Azeca, I, well, you have, I know you've right. been to Azeca, there are pot shirts everywhere you've got you can't it's like in indiana jones when they're walking on the bugs it's right. like you can't take a step <laughs> without stepping on pot shirts and so i can just see people just covering uh that site just turning over every pot shirt they yeah. see looking for an inscription like that no i thought what gideon avni said what dr avni said you know is that this is why we should never be talking about anything that doesn't come out of a controlled excavation and we can have discussions about, you know, 50 years ago and the origin of the scrolls. Keep in mind, they went and did excavations and confirmed the origin of a lot of these scrolls and, and you know, move forward. And But 
it's today. It's today. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's be honest about people loot and people forge. So let's just not even talk about, I know there are some scholars that say, well, let's put an asterisk by it. And, and, but then that allows an, an entire industry to continue on people to get paid and people to get published based on, you know, with the, with the Roger Maris asterisk up there. Let's, how about, let's just not talk about them. Let's not report about them. Let's, let's mm -hmm. assume that it's a guy forging it and Hey, look what I found when I was on my hike. Let's just, what's it going to teach us that we don't already know? We, we know yeah. King Darius was King. We know that it, it's, it's yeah. nothing. It's nothing. And move on from there. Yeah. And if, if we want to find these things in controlled excavations, well, let's fund more digs. Let's make it so it's not like pulling teeth to, to go find new places to excavate and to continue digging in places where we already have excavations going. If you want to spend a million dollars on something archaeological, uh, don't try to buy the equivalent of a, of a relic, right? I need to have a, a fragment of a Dead Sea Scroll with two letters on it so I can touch. Do what Mr. Lautenschläger did and fund an archaeological excavation. Yeah. Like put your name on an excavation, you know, the, the levy excavations, right? The put your name, endow a chair for an archaeologist. Do something that's going to be lasting and authentic instead of trying to buy something that you can then claim as a relic. This obsession yeah. with relics is a problem. If you want to contribute to the archaeological world and make archaeological discoveries, give the money to legitimate archaeologists so that they can go make legitimate discoveries. Yeah. And then you also have that uh, plausible deniability if they come up with something you don't because um, you know maybe the green initiative one day they start funding archaeological digs but uh, well suddenly they, they come up with the stuff that uh, are, are they doing that right well, now? well yeah no so so the they shifted right so what the greens did was they shifted from trying to buy all these what ended up being fake scrolls to actually funding an excavation in the Jezreel Valley Oh, good. So now they're actually oh. putting their money toward, and the condition was hands off. Yeah. Archaeologists are going to run this excavation. Totally. That's what needs to be happening. That's yeah. where the money should be going to archaeologists to do excavations. Good. Dan, it is always good to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you can join us again. Uh, yeah. I always enjoy hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate the invitation and your attention. And um, yeah, I always look forward to talking. Tell us once again when your next class is going to be. So it'll be Thursday, April 6th at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time. Great. And that will be on uh, how we got the biblical canon. Wonderful. If you're interested, don't forget to visit Dan's website. That's mcclellan.org. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't forget to sign up for his class. And you've got a new podcast that we should be paying attention to. Don't forget to visit Dan McClellan on all of his socials. I will be putting them here on the screen. <laughs> Dan McClellan, thanks again for joining us. Thanks so much, Bob. I appreciate it. You bet. Have a good one. You too.